Hello, today I'd like to present my modem design for the Q100 amateur radio geostationary payload. This is still a work in progress, but I wanted to share with you my findings so far. For those of you not familiar with Q100, three years ago SL2 was launched. This is a geostationary TV broadcast satellite which was uh, commissioned by the Katsoi company SLSAT. It carries the first and only today amateur radio geostationary payload. This was due to a collaboration between the Qatari Amateur Radio Society and AMSA DL, which is the German Amateur Satellite Association. This payload has been active since February 2019. The amateur radio transponder uses microwave bands, the uplink is in 2.4 GHz and the downlink is in 10.5 GHz. It's not so difficult to get working with this transponder because for the downlink we can use Q, Q, KU band LMBs uh, for digital TV broadcast. The KU band goes down to 10.7 GHz so these devices also work well at 10.5 GHz. And for the uplink, probably the most expensive part is the power amplifier and we can use Wi-Fi power amplifiers and also devices from cellular technology. We have those uh, for 2.1 GHz which can work unmodified or with small modifications. This is the footprint of the satellite. As you can see it covers all of Europe and Africa, uh, the Middle East. India, also some parts of China, Indonesia and Brazil. Unfortunately it doesn't cover the US or Australia or Japan but it covers a third of the world which is quite good. Q100 actually has two transponders which are as bent pipe transponders. The first one of them is a narrow band transponder. It's 500 kilohertz wide and uh, due to the band plans, your signals there can be up to 2.7 kHz wide and not stronger than a beacon which is relayed through the transponder. It is not generated on board, but generated on ground. The usage is quite similar to an HF band. So you can see the SSB analog voice, CW Morse code um, communications, narrow band digital communications as those used in HF. We also have the wide band transponder which is mainly intended for digital TV using DVB-S2 but it is also possible to do any sort of wide band digital experience as long as uh, we keep care not to interfere with other users. This transponder is 9 MHz wide and 1.5 MHz is continuously used up by the beacon which is a DVB-S2 transmission repeating a video loop and the band plan supports several channels of different widths. So you can see here on the graph, if we have a user using one megahertz of, of spectrum here, it occupies its channel. But if not, it can be used by three users with 333 kilohertz or many more users with narrower channels. So the idea for the digital modem is as follows. Uh, we should comply with the regulations for the narrowband transponder and those uh, make us not be stronger than the beacon which is approximately 50 dB Hz of CN0 and at most 2.7 kHz of bandwidth. And now the trick is uh, what is the maximum data rate we can fit in uh, those conditions. If we look at Shannon capacity for this kind of channel, which is depicted in this plot, we see that this is a severely bandwidth limited channel. Here we can see uh, the bandwidth in a logarithmic scale, the channel capacity also in log scale. The 2.7 limit is here, so anywhere in this area we cannot go because of the uh, transponder rules. Channel capacity is the red line, so anywhere in this black area we cannot go because of laws of physics. So in this white area is where our modem can work. We are uh, going to be on this line, so using the maximum bandwidth possible. 
and trying to get as close as possible to this corner which is 14 kilobits per second and it has a spectral density of 5.2 bits per hertz which is uh, rather uh, tricky to get working uh, these lines here are the constant bits per hertz lines so 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 and we see operating at more than 5 bits per hertz is rather tricky so well this kind of setting probably doesn't make sense in a professional or commercial endeavor uh, someone would say either you have too much power for that bandwidth or you have too little bandwidth uh, you should try to change things to make communication easier in an amateur setting still they are arguable for instance I have uh, talked a lot with uh, Phil Karn and Mario Lawrence about this kind of uh, communications modem and all the time it seems that uh, these restrictions are a little bit arbitrary and we could do better without them in fact uh, the conversation always uh, ends up with we should uh, try to use spread spectrum but anyhow I understand why these regulations are in place and it keeps uh, things working nice and tidy the way they usually work in HF so I like to see these constraints as an engineering exercise from which original solutions can appear because if you encounter a problem which is somewhat different uh, to what people have done maybe you use new tools or the same tools from a different perspective so the outcome can be interesting anyhow the goal as I said is to try to cram in as much data rate as possible within these constraints and perhaps there is no real practical application for this because uh, if you want a higher data rate than a few kilobits per second you can just go to a 125 uh, kilo symbols per second channel in the wideband transponder use uh, DVVS2 there and it will work uh, very well with uh, 50 dB Hz CN0 so maybe this idea is not so useful but I think uh, the problem provides its own set of rabbit holes to dig in and learn a lot and try to advance the state of the art here some previous work uh, leading to this modem de design is the following in December 2019 I was doing some experiments with 8 PSK 2 kilobyte, uh, so that is say, 6 kilobit per second here you can see the constellation using coherent communications the problem is that the uh, square losses on the cost loop are rather large and so we often get uh, face slips on the Custis loop so I decided to try differential 8PSK which uh, fixes that problem and it works well uh, of course you get some losses due to differential encoding but it works uh, with very few bit errors then uh, Kurt Morau uh, from ANSA TL came with his multimedia high speed modem design it can use different modes up to 8PSK at 2.4 kilobot and it uses Reed Solomon FEC uh, behind the scenes it's using liquid SDR so that's an SDR library this is a complete application with a, a graphical user interface you can send files, images, uh, digital voice and uh, it's multi-platform so I definitely suggest you check it out it's in the link here so motivated uh, by a card's progress I decided starting uh, in May this year not to be conservative and really try as hard as possible to cram in as much uh, bits per hertz as possible and to up the the bit rate the progress of this project has been rather slow because I'm uh, doing many more things on the side and I'm favoring more advanced solutions even if they require more development time in the end this doesn't uh, achieve to um, obtain some useful solution as I said but to rather serve as investigation, learning and uh, to come up with new ideas the design criteria 50 dB Hz 2.7 kHz bandwidth we assume ground stations use good hardware so very linear SDR devices stable frequency references because uh, frequency stability is rather tricky 
the modem latency shouldn't, shouldn't be too large. A few hundred of uh, milliseconds uh, should be good. Uh, this is comparable to the geostationary round trip time, so we shouldn't have very long latencies like 10 seconds, which would make it uh, difficult to carry out uh, back and forth communication. This is mainly intended for long transmissions with a continuous carrier, so not uh, packetized transmissions, and the receiver should be able to synchronize at any moment within a few hundred of milliseconds. So there should be enough uh, synchronization markers for the receiver. I'm drawing lots of ideas uh, from DVB-S2 because uh, the channel is the same in DVB-S2 and it's really well thought out. But some of the ideas in DVB-S2 are not really applicable due to our much lower symbol rate or bandwidth. So there is where we need to use some uh, novel ideas and ingenuity. The main challenge is uh, frequency stability, mostly on the 10.5 GHz reception. So the modern waveform is going to be a single carrier APSK waveform, just as in DVB-S2. We use RRC filtering with only 5% excess bandwidth. This is a minimum supported by DVB-S2X, and that's important to up the baud rate within our uh, bandwidth constraint. There are uh, long filters involved in these uh, designs, so uh, they need to be designed carefully. We will be using a symbol rate of 2570 baud, uh, so that with a 5% excess bandwidth it just fits inside 2.7 kHz. What about the data constellation? I have already mentioned this is going to be 32 APSK, and the motivation is the following. So, with our constraints, we have 15.9 ESN0, and we can go to this table on the DVB-S2 documentation where all the modulations and codings appear together with their ideal ESN0, and things start uh, very low, but towards the end of the table, we have uh, things which approach our 15.9 target, and in here we have 15.7, which corresponds to 32 APSK89. So this is probably the best candidate and, is, and it is what I'm using in most of the experiments I'm doing. This is what the 32 APSK constellation looks like and there are two radiuses which are used to define things. They depend on the coding rate and I actually don't know how these uh, radiuses have been optimized. Probably there is some simulation with the uh, FEC involved. Another interesting idea I haven't tried so far is 64 APSK. This is defined in the DVB-S2X standard. It's probably quite risky due to the high phase noise, but anyhow we have this table. Um, for instance, we have 15.87 dBs here, so we have 16 APSK45. That would be a good idea for a modem. This is more complex than 32 APSK. There are in fact uh, three different constellations organized in these uh, three ways and each of them is used uh, for different uh, modulation and coding. So let's get on with uh, synchronization. Synchronization is the most tricky part because carrier phase recovery is much more difficult than for your usual DVB-S2 at high symbol rates. Here the challenge is the low bandwidth so you can look at it uh, from a number of different perspectives but channel coherence time is on the order of 100 milliseconds this depends a lot of, on your uh, frequency reference for your ground station but we are assuming here that the user will have some sort of GPS DO either TCXO or OCXO based so with a PLL of 10 to 25 Hz we can track this uh, channel it's no problem and there is mo much more than enough SNR for phase tracking so for example if we only spend 32 dB Hz CN0 for phase recovery we have more than 20 dB of loop bandwidth which is uh, great it will give you a uh, very low phase noise the problem is that symbols are very long the channel coherence is only 250 symbols 
So any of the phase synchronization tools or techniques of DDVS2 do not work in this setting. The problem is, uh, for example, the uh, PLC headers, by the time you receive the next PLC header, many more than 250 symbols have passed and you have missed your channel. And the same happens for the pilot symbols, which are an option in DVBS2. They are just not as frequent as needed. So the possible approaches here are, we could use a residual car carrier. This is a constant CW carrier which is either on top of our signal or next to a signal. It is a simple solution, but it's somehow problematic in that if the carrier is uh, on top of the signal or next to it, we will get interference from the data modulation. And if it's a little bit away, then we increase the bandwidth, which is required for the modem. The second solution is to include pilot symbols in TDM. So that's make every, uh, one out of n uh, symbols make it be a pilot symbol and that is the solution we take here so out of every 50 symbols the first of them is a pilot symbol and this gives us around 50 pilot symbols per second which is enough to estimate our channel and keep uh, updated the estimate as the channel changes these pilot symbols are modulated in BPSK with a 31 symbol M sequence. Uh, this is great for synchronization because the sequence repeats every 600 milliseconds. So the synchronization time is still below one second. The receiver can detect this pilot sequence using circular correlation. So it can record a 600 millisecond buffer of samples and then uh, circular correlate and find uh, the current phase of this pilot symbol sequence. It is also useful for initial carrier frequency offset acquisition. Uh, we can get subhertz resolution with this correlation. But note uh, that to achieve this, the initial carrier frequency offset needs to be less than 25 hertz, just because we only have 50 uh, symbols per second. So we would get aliasing otherwise. This initial uh, frequency offset is easy to tune either by hand or with an open loop estimate. I have made a GNU radio implementation of this modem using custom C++ blocks and this has been tested both with simulation and over the air uh, tests through the Q100 transponder. So here you can see the main parts of the receiver. First there is an AGC then we do symbol synchronization. So uh, everything else works after symbol synchronization at one sample per symbol. And we have this uh, pilot acquisition of the pseudo random sequence. And then uh, this uh, gives initial estimates to the block downstream, which is the PLL, which works only with pilot symbols and divides the data and pilot symbols into two streams to be handled separately. This is a little uh, GUI from the GNU radio flow graph. Here we can see the constellation in one of the tests. In red we have the BPSK uh, pilots here and there. And in uh, blue we have the APSK constellation. And we can make out the individual symbols even though there is a little bit of confusion uh, due to the low SNR. This is another picture of the over-the-air tests. So some over-the-air tests uh, have been done basically to validate uh, synchronization, to see that it really works in practice with a real ground station. This is a picture of LINRAD. I like to use LINRAD uh, for spectrum visualization. And in here we can see the whole uh, 500 kilohertz of transponder bandwidth. In the middle we have this BPSK beacon which marks our power reference. These uh, two CW beacons on the sides which mark the edges of the transponder. And here is our signal, as you can see in the zoomed uh, spectrum. It has very steep uh, skirts and it occupies exactly 2.7 kilohertz. The results of these tests uh, and the IQ recordings are available online if you are interested in those. 
the uncoded beta rate was about 5% and here you can see another uh, nice plot of the constellation done with Python where you can see that yes there is some mix up between symbols but uh, some photo correction will be able to fix those so coming on to the for error correction design we will be using LDPC codes here again following the DVVS2 standard our synchronization sequence which uh, lasts 600 milliseconds gives us a natural uh, frame size of 7595 bits that is uh, the data bits which are transmitted along a repetition of this 31 symbol BPSK sequence and here the challenge is that the frame size is not so large so LDPC code words using DVBS2 are much longer the normal ones are 64.8 kilobits and the short ones are 16.2 kilobits so that's uh, more than double or frame size and LDPCs work uh, much better with longer frame sizes so here we, is where we get some uh, losses in comparison to DVBS2. As we advance, we are trying to design a rate 8 over 9 code, uh, which uh, fits our uh, EBN0 target, uh, that's 9.42 dBs using 32 APSK. And the design of this uh, LDPC code is still a work in progress, so nothing set on stone uh, so far. When I started working in this, I found that there are many references that explain how to implement LDPC decoders. However, there are not so many references which explain how to design your own LDPC code, since in most applications you are just given the uh, LDPC code. It comes determined from your protocol or your application. But here we are free to design our code and we would like to design a code which adapts to our uh, frame size and to our target EBN0. I have been uh, mainly using Sarah Johnson's book, uh, Iterative Error Correction, and the references which appear in there to some papers to understand the different techniques to build uh, LDPC codes. I'm using AFF3CT for simulation. This is both a library and a command line tool which are implements several error correction schemes and you can run benchmarks and it's uh, quite fast in fact some lessons learned are that pseudo random constructions work rather well for moderate and long code sizes and in fact for 7.6 uh, kilobits uh, frame size uh, they work really well but the code structure is very important so things such as the column weight of your parity check matrix will set the difference from one kind of construction and another one. We do not care too much about the computational code here because the bit rate is low and we assume that the user will use a PC uh, to decode this so it will be more than capable. So for example the DVVS2 LDPCs are irregular repeat accumulate and they have a very efficient way to be encoded. Here we lose this property with pseudo random codes but we do not care so much. I have developed a small tool in Rust called LDPC Toolbox to help me with this design and this implements uh, some matrix computations, some pseudo random constructions of LDPC codes and the constructions of all the parity check matrices of the DVBS2 codes. This can be used both as a command line tool and as a library and you can check out the tool here. These are some of the results and uh, let me unpack for you this comparison. So here in red and blue we have uh, two different pseudo random constructions for our code size of 7.6 kilobits. These are the McCainil construction in red and the progressive edge growth algorithm in blue. 
Next up, we are comparing with the code size in the short DVBS2 FEC frames. So in green, we have the DVBS2 short frames, and in yellow, we have the McAneal construction for the same code size. So you can, you can see that this pseudo-random construction is even slightly better than the DVBS2 code, but we are losing some performance uh, due to the difference in code size. And here in light blue, we have the long effect frames of DBBS2. They give extremely good performance. And in fact, the simulation only goes to 9.1 uh, dBs of EBN0. Because uh, further than that, the frame error rate was too low. And uh, the simulation would have taken uh, many, many hours to complete. So we could say here that we are done, in fact, uh, 9.4 dBs of EBN0, which is our target, is uh, around here. And if we look at the frame error rate, we have less than 0.1% uh, of frame, uh, sorry, a little bit more than 0.1% uh, of frame error rate, which I think is slightly too high, but Anyway, the 50 dBs of CN0 was just a uh, target. No one would really care if we run our modem, uh, say, uh, 0.5 dBs stronger. In fact, the beacon is usually a few dBs stronger than 50 dBs. But of course, uh, this is not really the end of the story. The question is, can we do any better than this? And at first, I wasn't sure because uh, well, the frame size is what it is, unless we want to have uh, more than one second latency. So in there we cannot improve. Uh, comparatively with DVBS2, we are doing quite well. But then I found uh, that there are much better codes. So David McKay made an encyclopedia of assorted LDPC codes. He has uh, many, many different types of codes both uh, very short and very long. It's available on his web page. And we find the very interesting codes, which I have plotted here with the other ones. So here in purple, we see this one, which uh, doesn't seem to perform so well until you realize that the frame size is only 3,584 bits. So that's less than half the frame size we are using for our modem yet the performance is comparable. In fact, if we look just at the frame error rate, it's more or less the same. So that's astounding that uh, with a much shorter code size, it manages uh, more or less the same performance. And then there is, uh, it is shown here in pink, so maybe you can see it here and here. That's a code which has 16,383 uh, bits so that's more or less the same as these codes, but their performance is much, much better. So I'm amazed by these results. I didn't expect these codes to work so well. And now my question is, what's the secret sauce here? And I yet don't know. I haven't really looked much into the techniques uh, McKay used to design these, but I think this is the way to go. So if there's a way to design a custom LDPC code that would give us uh, maybe half a dB advantage over this uh, McAneal and progressive edge growth construction, we should really dig into that hole and see how that can be achieved. And uh, with this, I come to the end of the talk. So thank you very much for listening. I have these two references here. They are uh, posts in my blog. And you have all the links to the software, the GNU Radio modem is on GitHub and also the results and IQ recordings. Thank you very much for listening.